So I'm thinking about this series that we are getting ready to start today, and I'm thinking about how, yeah, my mouth gets me in trouble sometimes. It really does. And so many of you, I'm sure, can relate. So I'm thinking about, you know, what would be a good example of a big fat mouth? Or what would be a good example of a mouth that doesn't build people up or doesn't say the right things all the time? Or maybe a mouth or an attitude of heart that can be, you know, challenging. It really is so easy to do. And again, I'm reflecting back on my own life and some of the things I do and I say, and I'm like, you know, I wish I could go back and do some, some of those things over again. How many times have we all said that? If I knew then what I know today, it'd be different. I'd be a different person. I would do things differently. My attitude would be so much different than it was way back then. So I started thinking about, again, attitude of heart or your big mouth and how it gets you in trouble and grumbling and complaining and things. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking back in Scripture, and what do I come up with? Well, the Israelites. Oh, my gosh. Those people never stopped complaining. They grumbled and complained all the time. What a horrible example. When you think about it, the Israelites grumbled and complained even after God had sent 10 different plagues to free them from the bondage of Egypt. Now think about it. Here they are enslaved they're making bricks. They're building things. People, thousands of people are dying from the nation of Israel all the time. They are living under Egyptian rule. And God provides for them. He sends Moses and he sends this entourage and he sends 10 different plagues. 10 different plagues he sends in order to convince the Pharaoh to let his people go. And what do they do? They complain. The whole time. They complained. Even after they parted, or they saw God part the Red Sea. And they traveled across the Red Sea. Almost a million people walk across the Red Sea on dry land. And they get over to the other side and they complain. They still complained. Even though they watched after they were on the other side of the Red Sea, what did they see? They, they watched the Egyptian army come through on dry land too, and then God closes up the water and drowns them all and saves them. And they still are complaining. They wake up in the morning, they're out in the desert, and they're walking around, and they're following Moses. And, and every single morning they get up and they eat this manna that God has provided from, from heaven. This, they didn't have to grow it, they didn't have to plant it, they didn't have to water it, they didn't have to weed it, they didn't have to do anything other than go out there and put it in their basket and go home and enjoy it. And they still complained. And when they got thirsty, what does God do? He goes to all kinds of extremes, including bringing water out of a rock. And they still complain. Can you, can, can you kind of get the picture of where these people are at? They're complaining about everything and anything. The Bible tells us that during the 40 years that they wandered in the desert, he made sure that their clothes never wore out. Not a single sandal strap broke. Not a single piece of clothing wore out. Now, I don't know about you. I like wearing jeans all the time. I wear, you know what I mean? But after 40 years, I'd expect some holes. But no. Nothing was wearing out. They had food to eat that came down out of heaven in the, uh, during the night. All they had to do was pick it up in the morning, and they had water coming from rocks, and, and they were being protected by, you know, by God parting the Red Sea and letting them cross and drowning their... And they griped, and they complained, and their whole spirit seemed to be against what God was trying to do with them. Here's what they said to Moses. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What were they saying? Wait a minute. Was there not enough room in Egypt for all the graves that would need to be dug for us to die there? So you brought us out here in the middle of the desert so there'd be enough room for all of us? 
What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. These are some very dissatisfied people. And then the one that really sends a lightning bolt down my spine is this one. It comes out of the book of Exodus, chapter 14. You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Oh. Moses is telling him, hey, you're, you're, not, you're not grumbling against me. You're grumbling against the one, the one true God, who is the one that is bringing you out of Egypt, the one that is, is doing all of this, is ushering you in safety, providing for you all along the way. You're not just complaining against me. Oh, no, 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 no. You're complaining against God. Careful where you're walking. Now, some of you might be feeling a little bit uneasy right now. Because we have a tendency, like the Israelites, to complain. We do. We complain about parking. We complain sometimes about our kids. We complain sometimes about running out of coffee. We complain sometimes about the line at the Myers. We complain sometimes about the person in the drive through ahead of us. We complain about... Well, even in church, the music's too loud. Or I don't like what they're playing. Or it's too dark in here. Or it's too light in here. See, we can find all kinds of things to complain about. What is it that you complain about most in your life? I've heard, as a pastor, I've heard a lot of complaints. Well, I, 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 wish, I, could, I wish I was married. I wish I could be married. And then you hear the other one, well, I'm married, you know, how great is that? <laughs> well, it's true. I hear all kinds of complaints. I hear people complaining about meetings. Oh, I, I can't serve, you know, there's so many meetings and I can never attend those meetings. You know, they're so boring. You know, I hate meetings. Wah, 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 wah. Shut up. <laughs> but we complain about things, meetings and Bosses, I don't like the way the boss does it. He's obviously doing it wrong because I have a better idea and my ideas are better than his because he's not doing it my way. One of my favorites is when we're younger, you know, we always aspire to greater things. So we, we look at our house and we say, you know, our house is too small and there's not enough room here for all the kids and not everybody has a bedroom and we don't have enough storage and... So we, we'll get a bigger house, and then we get a bigger house, and then we get older, and it's like, oh, the house is too big. You know, we got to downsize now. We got to get rid of this. And we're just never happy. We complain. The one that I like the best, and it really amazes me, is the way people will put their complaints on social media. Hold the phone, man. I can't believe some of the stuff people put out there. Because it's a declaration of what's going on in their life and what's going on in their own heart and, and in their own little world. And it's like, holy cow, this person. Whew. And of course, a lot of times it's about minor things. Like, you know, it's a little too chilly today. Or, or you know, we're, we're somewhere and the Wi-Fi is slow and we complain about it. The problem that we have isn't that the weather is too cold or that the Wi-Fi is too slow or that we can't find something to binge watch on Netflix. That's, that's not the problem. The problem that we have is that really Satan has taken our eyes off of the fact of the goodness of God. He's taken our eyes off of the fact that God is good and that the plans that he has for each and every one of us is good. Just like with the Israelites. Everything that God was doing there was good and they lost sight of that. 
You see, what Satan has done is he's replaced this concept of the goodness of God with this concept of self. It's about me. It's about what I like. It's about what I expect. It's about what I enjoy. It's about where I want to be. It's about what my goals and aspirations are. It's about the way I think things should be done. Is that really the way God wants us to live? Centered on ourselves? So anyway, I'm thinking, as I, as I like to do, especially when I'm riding in the car. I never turn the radio on because I like to think. And I'm riding along, and I'm thinking, well, in the Bible, who would be the person that had the, the most right to complain? And I come up with this guy by the name of Paul. And when you think about it, Paul, who was originally Saul, he was adamantly against this whole Jesus movement. He was a very devout, very religious man. And he was persecuting the early church to beat the band. And, and, and after his conversion, after he had this experience with Christ, Paul became converted and he became a believer. And Paul originally thought that what he was going to do was, was going to go to the Roman Empire and become the preacher of the good news to the Romans. Because after all, Paul was a Roman citizen. And that's where he thought he was going to be. But what happened to him? Paul ends up becoming a prisoner of the Romans. He's thrown in prison. He's thrown down into this, this jailhouse, this miserable place. Do you know what they used to do with all the, uh, the I guess I would say, horse droppings back in those days? You know where they went? Throw them into prison. My point is it was not a very pleasurable place to be. Paul finds himself there as opposed to teaching and preaching to all these people in Rome where he thought he was going to end up. He finds himself as a prisoner. And he's in there for over two years awaiting his own execution. Now you want to talk about a miserable place to be. It stinks. It's nasty. I'm not fed well. I'm waiting for my own execution, which I don't have any idea when that's going to be. Paul had every reason, I think, to complain to God and say, this isn't quite what I had in mind. This isn't quite what I signed up for. Because being a Roman citizen, with all of my extensive education and all of my background and all, I think I could be best used, you know, by, by traveling around Rome and preaching and teaching in the synagogues and so forth. But instead, he finds himself in a prison. How disheartening. He had every reason to say, you know what? The floor is hard, the food's crappy, and these Roman guards smell. But he didn't. Paul writes to the Philippians, and he says these words. Chapter 2. He says, do everything without grumbling or complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and a crooked generation. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault. Is that not something to, be, to aspire to? He continues and he says, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should rejoice and be glad with me. You got to remember an offering back then was an animal that was sacrificed and was laid on a burning offering. Then they would take very expensive wine and they would pour the wine on the offering and allow the smoke to rise. Paul didn't see his pending death as a sacrifice. He saw his life 
the life that he was living at the moment, the life that he knew came from God in the place that God ordained for him, he saw that as his living sacrifice. Philippians chapter 1, he writes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everybody else that I am in chains for Christ. What was he saying? He says, you think I'm a prisoner? You think it makes any difference what it's like down here? He says, you think it makes any difference how good the meals are or how comfortable the situation is down here or what it smells like? He says, absolutely not. He says, man, I have a different Roman guard chained to me each and every day. I have a captive audience. And he says, because of that, the entire palace guard knows that I'm here because of my faith and who Jesus Christ is. And they know exactly who I used to be. They know exactly how I persecuted the church. And they now have a living witness right here among them. And Paul is rejoicing in this. He's saying, you've got to be kidding me. He says, no, it's not what I expected. It's not what I chose. It's not what I want. But I realize now that what God is doing is he is allowing me one person at a time to witness to him so that and it's gone on for so long. Everybody in the palace guard, plus so many other people, know the story about Jesus and why I'm willing to suffer the way that I've been suffering. He's saying, this is, man, this is ministry. This is awesome. Paul took a look at his circumstances and realized that complaining was not the right thing to do. Complaining wasn't the, the way to go. Complaining wouldn't serve any real purpose. What Paul did was he looked at it and he said, you know, he says, these are the circumstances I'm in. How is it that God can use the circumstances that I'm in right now as a way to change people's hearts, to motivate people to believe in the Christ? How can I serve God being chained to a Roman guard? And I want you to understand, back in those days, being a Roman guard was a very important position. It was a very influential position. This was not just some run-of-the-mill dude. No, these were important people. You had to earn your way into this position. You were respected. People listened to you. And Paul knows all this, and he's like, man, this is sweet. I gotta tell you, he says, I got these people chained to me every single day, and they, they, they might not all accept it, but they can't get away from me. How would that be for ministry in the church? Huh? We bring them in by the busloads and we chain them to each other. What do you think? <laughs> huh? Can you picture it? What are you chained to? There's the question that started coming into my own mind. What are you chained to? What am I chained to? Is it a job? Is it maybe some health issues? Maybe it's some relationships that, that are tough to deal with, that I'm chained to because of the circumstances. Maybe it's some kind of financial deal. Maybe it's a failing marriage. Maybe it's some kind of addictions or something. I don't know. But each one of us, like the Apostle Paul, needs to take a look at where we are in life and ask ourselves that question. What are we chained to? Where are the opportunities to be a witness for Christ in our own life as opposed to complaining about the things that we're subject to? You know, like the Israelites, sometimes we forget God's in charge. I may not like it, I may not agree with it. I may not even understand it. But what's important 
And what I'll, what I'll answer for one day is what I did with it. What do you do with it? What do you do with the circumstances that you have? They might be terrible circumstances. They might be wonderful circumstances. But it is how I use those circumstances for the blessing of sharing my faith with another individual that makes all the difference in the world. I'm absolutely convinced that conversation is going to take place between us and Christ one of these days. What did you do with the opportunities I gave you? And did you even recognize them, or did you whine your way through them? Here's the deal. If you can change your negative circumstances, do something about it. Do it. God gave you strength. He gave you a body. He gave you intellect. He gave you resources. He gave you all kinds of stuff. If you can change your circumstances for the better and for other people's betterment, then do it. But if you can't, you need to change your attitude. You need to change the way you view things. You need to change your own perspective. And I'm talking to myself here, guys, because I'm as guilty as anybody in not seeing things always as a blessing and is under the control of God. The other day, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, in the office and, and our youth leader, Maddie, came to see me. Everybody knows Maddie, right? Shake up, go like this. Well, Maddie was upset. She was very distraught and crying. And she told me that her circumstances had changed and that at the end of May, she has to leave us. So at the end of May, we'll be once again without a youth person, youth leader. But I needed to remind Maddie that day that God uses the circumstances of our life always for good. If we believe anything about him, let's believe that one. That while she's been here, she's had the opportunity, a young college girl has had the opportunity to share with our youth the fact that she loves God enough, loves Christ enough, believes in him enough, that she's willing to devote some of her own personal time to sharing that good news, that faith, that example with other people. I say it's a win-win situation. Not to look at it as, oh, my ministry can't continue the way I thought it would, and I wouldn't, I'm not going to be there as long as I thought I would be there, and, and I can't do all the things that I thought I was going to do. And but, Okay. Okay. It doesn't mean that God hasn't used the moments that we have been there, or that you have been there, for good. That God hasn't used those moments as a teaching lesson that might pop up in the lives of some of our youth years from now when all of a sudden they'll remember, oh yeah, I remember Maddie said this once. Or I remember Maddie's example under, in, a, in a certain situation once. No, God uses people in circumstances and we that you and I will never understand, but we have this natural human tendency to whine about it. Don't whine about it, celebrate it. I had a reminder of that. I said, think about the witness when, when most of the people on CMU's campus wouldn't set foot in a church, and yet you do it willingly. To me, that speaks volumes to our kids. Volumes. I want you to walk away with a couple of things today. The way you handle them situations in your life will always speak to other people, always. The way that you react to different situations will always speak to other people. The way you exercise your limited faith will always speak to other people. The way your heart finds a light when there's nothing but darkness around you will always speak to another individual 
will always serve as a witness to another person. Don't ever box God in a corner through your own expectations or your own understanding of things because he doesn't work that way. He works in, as they say, mysterious ways. Now, my big fat mouth, how it gets me in trouble because of my complaining and my arrogance and my misunderstanding at times. Does that mean that my heart or my mouth can't be used for good? Not at all. <coughs> Let's just remember that complaining really is against God because he is in control of everything. And I didn't say it was easy. Oh my goodness, it's not. I've always said Christianity, faith is the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. And I honestly believe it. But I do believe that God is good all the time. Father God, be with us as we do go forward from this place. I pray, Lord, that you would just implant in each one of our hearts a freshness, a newness, to understand that you're in control of it all. And in you, we can trust. And that we should be like the Apostle Paul, joyful in the midst of whatever circumstances come our way. And I pray that you would help us to do that. And it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Yeah. God, God bless and have a wonderful week.